everybody, welcome to the SABC online service. So good to have you all with us today. We've got a sweet lineup for you, starting off with some praise and worship, hopefully get you into the spirit. Then we're transitioning into some messages and we hope you find it inspiring and we would love to see you here next Sunday with us. Turning lives around 
주여 이들랑이 주여 이들페누아 주여 이들나고 
Thank you, uh, Brenda. That's amazing. What a story to hear at your mum's funeral, eh? About your dad and her. Um, transformation is what Christianity is about. Jono last week shared an amazing story of his transformation. I love it when I hear of people who've been on drugs and they're set free like that. You know, I know there are others who, who they have to go through the whole process and everything, but the power of God came on Jono and just set free. I asked him afterwards, how often were you taking drugs? He said to me, oh, he said, I'd wake in the night, and I'd have to take drugs through the night as well. So 24 hours a day, he was taking drugs to survive, and God set him free just like that. And then this young lady um, comes to faith, ends up a, an army officer, and taking um, your mum's funeral. That's transformation. But what I want to say to all of us is it can happen for you. The end result of your transformation is not yet written because you're still alive. Yeah. As long as you're breathing, there's more that God wants to do. And who knows the transformation that he can bring into your life and my life. There's probably areas of our lives that we've somehow just managed to keep to the side and they haven't been opened yet by Jesus, but he might want to. And the transformation that can take place there is huge. Anyone glad that Jesus interrupted their life and saved them? Man, I don't know where I would be or what I would be. My ex-senior pastor, or my senior pastor, Murray Cottle, the um, person I regard as that, he says, I would be an absolute alcoholic. I'd have lost my marriage. I'd have lost my kids if I didn't know Jesus. He said, that was the history of my, of my family. I, I watched it. And he said, it would be me too, but Jesus transformed me, and I'm different. So I want to plant something in your heart today that you really want to be different. You know, they say wisdom comes with years. Have you heard that? You can get a new perspective on life. I saw an email this week. I thought I'd read it to you. It said a 72-year-old man had one hobby. He loved to fish, and his name wasn't Mike. He was sitting in his boat the other day when he heard a voice say, pick me up. And he looked around, he couldn't see anyone. He thought he was dreaming. When he heard the voice say again, pick me up. He looked in the water and there floating on the top was a frog. And the man said, are you talking to me? And the frog said, of course I'm talking to you. Pick me up, then kiss me and I'll turn into the most beautiful woman you've ever met. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that all your friends are envious and jealous because I will be your bride. Well, the man looked at the frog for a short time, reached over, picked it up carefully, and placed it into his shirt pocket. The frog said, what are you nuts? Didn't you hear what I said? Kiss me, and I will I'll be your beautiful bride. And the man opened his pocket, and he looked down at the frog, and he said, nah, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> and you know, it's good when we can look at our life... And, and look back and we can 
make some changes and we can make some new choices and because we get a new perspective on our life. And I want to challenge some of us today to do that because the topic that I want to talk about is the topic of evangelism. And perhaps your perspective on that word needs to change. Mine certainly did. You know, I was really negative and intimidated by the thought of having to go out evangelizing. And that can become a roadblock in our minds. And if you've got a roadblock in your mind still, I want to challenge you to change and let the Lord change you. Because it is possible to share your faith and to have the privilege of leading some people to Christ. I don't know how many people you've yet led to Christ, but I think one of the questions we will ask ourselves and that the Lord will ask us when we get to heaven is who's here because of you? Who have you influenced? Who have you spoken to that made that transforming change? Dez is having the time of his life. Today is an exciting day for him because he's, he's going to share the love of Jesus with someone who doesn't know it and may not have heard that love before. And it's possible that if we are negative towards evangelism, oh yeah, there are other gifts, I'll use those gifts. Someone else can do the evangelism thing that you can change your attitude today. You know, there is a new momentum that I'm picking up in the church's life. It may be because I'm leaving. But there's this new buzz, and it has to do with sharing faith. It's become exciting because we're hearing stories that people are having of conversations. Not all the conversations mean that a person comes to a point where they say, I want to follow Jesus, but they're having conversations that are just edging and helping people forward towards the goal of becoming a Christian. You know, every Christian and every church has five purposes, and they're exciting. The first one is worship. Ben, you're just a great worshiper. If ever I don't feel like worshiping, I look at you, and you inspire me to go after God, and you've always been that way. And then the second purpose of the church is fellowship. God wants to build community, and the more that you can socialize together and relate together and get together in small groups and study the Bible and have coffee and laughter out there, God is building fellowship. It's, it's the purpose of part of the purpose of your life in the church. And then there's personal growth. And that's why we run courses from time to time and encourage you to be there. But just every Sunday, hearing a motivational talk on how to live life well as a Christian in the 21st century is part of what shapes us and grows us up. And then there's ministry. Every single one of us needs to be involved in ministry and helping the work of the church to go forward and to, and to um, uh, just expand. And then there's the fifth one, which is, yeah, sharing our faith, evangelism. And, and there's a new momentum in the church about that, but it needs to include you if you're not already excited about it and determine that you're going to actually, actually say, God, use me. Give me an opportunity. If you're not praying for some people to get saved, then, then make up a list and, and start looking at your life and your friends again and saying, man, could I imagine getting to heaven and them not being there? It's motivating. It's a bit like David's words that he wrote in the Psalms, in Psalm 71, starting at verse 14. It says, But I will always have hope, and I will praise you more and more. I will tell how you do what is right. I will tell about your salvation all day long, even though it is more than I can tell. I will come and tell about your powerful works, Lord God. I will remind people that only you do what is right. God, you have taught me since I was young. To this day, I tell about the miracles miracles you do. Even though I'm old and gray, do not leave me. God, I will tell the children about your power, and I will tell those who are not even yet alive about your might. That's what David wrote. He did it in his generation, and we're still reading about what he did and the telling that he did about the goodness of God and the salvation of God today. Every generation since David has has seen the fruit of what he determined right there. 
And I want to suggest to you that that kind of attitude is supposed to be normal for us as Christians. Carl was like this last week when he was talking about sharing in his work situations. He's saying, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm not going to hide my light under a, under a bushel or a rock or a, a lampshade or whatever. He said, I'm going to let it be known. And he says, when someone asks me about the weekend, I'm going to tell them about the fun that I'm having in church, especially about the band. Carl said, the band, the band. And he wants people to know that the church has a great band. And even just that word can absolutely blow some people's thinking of what church is like. You mean you have a band and music that you might hear on the radio in church? Don't you sing old songs about that are real great for people who've already died? (laughs) Well, we sing some of those occasionally. If you come on Easter... You'll hear more of them. But mostly it's the kind of songs that are expressing new thoughts and new ways that would be heard on any radio. And he's he's, he's, he's sounding like David. He's enthused. He's, He's excited about being able to share that. You know, much of the church in New Zealand is very weak in evangelism. But I want to suggest to you that that is going to change. I think what God is going to do across the church, not just us, but across his church, is he's going to bring a wave that is going to see evangelism become far more normal and people getting saved happening around about all over the place. I think it's going to become some, one of the main topics as we go into the next uh, number of years. Now, a church will reflect its senior leader And I've been here 24 years, so sadly, whether I like it or not, the church reflects in many ways me. And and over the years, I would rather teach than encourage in evangelism and be involved in evangelism myself. Because I got put off as a young Christian in a really big way. And perhaps you are like me. And there's a roadblock that you've had to block a get down or is still blocking you right now from really getting excited about people coming to faith. But I want to say to you, I was that, but over the years I have changed. You know, just prior to getting saved at around the age of 15 or 16, I got kind of accosted by two really um, excited Christians in a bus Stand outside Lynn Mall in West Auckland. And I needed to go home so I couldn't get away from them, but they really wanted me to know that was I saved? And did I know that without Jesus I was going to hell? And, and what happened if the bus ran me over tonight instead of taking me home? And they had me pressed right up against the wall, and, and I felt embarrassed, and I felt intimidated, and I felt convicted. But the other two emotions were really strong with me. And I went home that night thinking, man, I hated that. And I don't ever want to see people put in that kind of situation. And and I don't want to ever do that to someone at all. And, And what happened was this mental block began to build. But, you know, the funny thing was that over the next couple of years, I witnessed to all my mates... Five of them gave their hearts to Jesus over a couple of years because of the change that had been happening in me, but I never thought of that as evangelism. Evangelism to me had to do with this putting people against a wall, and I didn't want anything to do with it. After I'd been saved about seven years, God spoke to me about going to Bible college. And so I went, and and we had to preach there, and preaching sessions at Bible college. How many of you are college grads? Bible college grads, you know what it's like to be at Bible college and have to preach and then you get analysed, <laughs> criticised, cut down. Uh, you know, especially if you're a strong introvert like me, it could be the worst thing that could possibly happen for you. You know, it could take weeks to heal, maybe years, maybe a lifetime, maybe you would never heal. You can kind of feel really over the top. And so I preached, and strangely, I preached powerfully. And to my surprise, it became one of the things that made me realize that God had a call on my life to pastor a church, was how this went. But at the end of the message, everyone just sat transfixed. And the lecturer said to me, okay, give an altar call, as if it was a real one. And I stumbled a couple of sentences and good and guard and 
just stopped, and eventually the lecturer said, no, that's okay, don't worry. Um, but, but we're not going to critique John, we're just going to listen to what God's been saying to us, and then we'll go out. But, you know, I was devastated, because I'd been asked to say what the gospel is and encourage people to respond to the gospel. I didn't have a clue. What did you say? How did you say it? How much did you have to say? Did that have to be? How long did it have to be that you, you shared? And as I look back, I wish my lecturer had said, hey, John, you, you did such a good job here, but you struggled here. Can I mentor you? Can I give you some advice? Can I tell you how I do it when I'm in that sort of situation? But he never did. So instead of me being able to get a positive understanding of sharing faith there, my internal block, my mental block, just doubled in size. And then the third incident was when I was at college also doing the, our evangelism course. And we had several weeks of training on evangelism and things. And then the lecturer said, OK, let's get out of our seats. We're going to go down to the local strip mall, um, you know, group, group of strop, uh, shops down there, and we're going to do some evangelism. So we all tentatively, as slowly as we could, drove down to the shopping area, and we went to talk to people about Jesus. And there weren't many people, but I did notice one guy in about his 40s or 30s who was um, waiting. He was doing the guy thing while his wife was in the shop shopping. He was outside in his nothing box. He was just enjoying the sun. And eventually I got up enough courage to go up to him and say, have you ever thought of the Christian way of life? To which he, uh, in a shocked way, said no. And I couldn't think of another question to ask. And he didn't want me to ask anything. So we separated. But the trouble was I still had 30 minutes of time that I had to stay here and witness to people. And he's, his wife was still shopping. So occasionally I, would, or I looked across at him and he was trying to hide behind a hat rack and some other clothes and things so that I wouldn't think of another question and come and ask him another question. And it was this incredibly embarrassing, terrible situation from, from my um, perspective. And my internal block grew a whole lot more. I can't do this. Others might have the gift, but this obviously isn't something God wants me to do. Are you anything like what I was? And the fourth incident happened when I, when I was finding the anointing over my life. I, I, I became a youth pastor, and, and I, I, we took a kind of an impromptu camp one Easter uh, at a beach uh, north of Auckland, and, and I told the Easter story. And I got to the end, and I could see that quite a few of the young people were hanging on every word. They were just listening. They were, they were really open to me. And, and I choked on the application. I didn't say, so would any of you like to consider following this Jesus who forgives sins? I just choked. Because remember, my internal block is, I can't do this. Two weeks later, one of the young guys who was on that camp, the senior pastor, Murray Cottle, led him to the Lord and, uh, at church. And he had obviously told the story of, of Easter and how affected he was and, and by my message and, and he came out to, the pastor came out to me and he said, Hey, John, um, he's just given his heart to the Lord. Why didn't you ask him to become a Christian two weeks ago? And I have uh, a few words to say. And it just, instead of some, me being absolutely wrapped that I had a part to play in this person came, coming to the Lord, my internal block just told me, You're a chicken. There's a chicken line that you have to come up to. You didn't even walk towards it. And so my block got bigger. I wish if I redid it now and that scene happened and the pastor came to me and said those words to me, hey, he was ready to give his heart when you, gave, gave, uh, you, know, when you were talking about what Jesus did. I could have asked my senior pastor, would you help me? I get stuck at that point. And I think my ministry would have expanded hugely and be different right now 
if it had happened way back then when I was um, 28 years of age. So perhaps you're like me and you've got some different reasons but the same block. You've had bad experiences. You know, there's, there's lots of things that, that um, we can do to, to change that. Some people amongst us here today and some that are running in a marathon and some that are doing other things, uh, relaxing in different places around the South and North Island, have, but a part of our church, have the gift of evangelism. So they're like Rowan and it's not hard to get into conversations and to talk about Jesus Christ. But doesn't it matter if we don't have that gift, we are all, says when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we're to be witnesses. So God expects that we will all share about what's going on in our life, about how Jesus is changing us. We're to be witnesses. And there are some great tools that the body of Christ has, uh, tools like Alpha that are absolutely known even to non-Christians. They know, there's so many people that have come to faith through Alpha Often that name is, is known. We can talk about that. It's a doorway. But we also need to prepare a 30-second testimony. That if someone says, why do you go to church? 30 seconds. You can give something that will cause that person to think. Or we also need to prepare a two-minute testimony so that we can share a little bit more about why our life is where it is now and what it could have been without Jesus being with us. You know, I love being around evangelists. Anyone else? Not necessarily when they're on the street. But in the setting where I can be comfortable in the small group, cell group, and church, and hear their stories, it just does something to excite me. And I believe it's almost true that a top-flight evangelist could talk about soap and then ask someone to come to Christ, and they'll find that some people get saved. It's like that. I was on holiday a few years ago when my friend Gordon came up for the day to where we camp and he was having tea with Barry and Joy Sluters and Barry's youngest son's girlfriend was there and I wandered over for coffee about 9pm and they hadn't been talking about spiritual things but Gordon was just about to leave so he turns to um, this girl and he says to her, would you like to become a Christian? And she said, yes. And I'm sitting there going, how do you do that? And I love Gordon's testimony because he was part of a brethren church and evangelist was preaching. Often they'd have Sunday night evangelism meetings and you bring your mates along and, and people would get saved at the night preaching. And he wants to go to the toilet just as the evangelist named George Curl um, says, if you want to become a Christian... Go to the back of the room and there'll be people there to talk to you. He's just going to the back of the room. He's going to the bathroom. And someone steps up to him and says, would you like to become a Christian? Can you imagine his dilemma? <laughs> um, <laughs> he said yes. And he's been gloriously saved ever since. God does amazingly funny things at times. But, you know, it's not supposed to be such hard work as, as we sometimes make it out to be. What I didn't understand was what's called the Ingalls scale. Now, um, James F. Ingle in 1975 wrote a book, What's Gone Wrong with the Harvest? And he said, everyone's on a journey either towards God or away from God. And... Um, some are a long way away, or we put it this way, if here's where someone becomes a Christian, some are way down here. And others are very close to the point of being interested in spiritual things and, and interested in be becoming a Christian. And he said the scale carries on in discipleship as people grow and become mature. But the Engel scale is mostly about where are people on that scale. And, and, and I, I love what Russell Watts um, says. He just pulls it right back to red and green apples. And he said, some people are like a green apple. They're open. They're ready. It's a green light. Other people are like a red apple. They're way down here. And if we, if we try to talk to someone who's not even interested in God way down here in the way that we would talk to someone who's a green apple up here, we will usually cause that person to go further away from God. And Russell says, don't bruise the fruit as we're trying to 
create interest in Christianity with people. Isn't that helpful? See, when we understand that, we don't have to give everybody everything if we have a conversation. We, we can go fishing with someone and put something spiritual out like Carl does. I love being in the band at church. And if someone picks up on that and starts to ask them about it, they're quite green. They're ready, quite ready, and he can talk to them at a level that talks about Jesus Christ, and it's good. And understanding that just simplifies everything and makes the pressure come off for me and for you as to what we should do and how we should be talking to them. But there is a chicken line. There is a line in the sand that doesn't seem to go away no matter how experienced you get. Even if you talk to Rowan, who, who just loves evangelism and, and these stories are circulating now, um, I'm sure she'll say that, yes, I still have to step over and choose to engage with people rather than just staying back here as well. Sev- there are several things that we can do to prepare. The 30-second testimony. David obviously had a 30-second testimony. He's just bubbling about his enthusiasm of what God's been doing in his life lately. You know, when the checkout operator says to me on a Sunday, as I'm, I'm, as I'm there about 12 o'clock or, or 1 p.m., how's your day going? I need to have a spiritual reply that I can give to the checkout later, uh, lady. I could say... Sunday's the best day of my week. I'm having a great day. I've just been to church. And the band, you know the band, they just rocked it today. Or we've just had, I've just had a, an incredible motivational talk from Robert. And, and it's just tuned my life up. And the checkout person will go, that's great. And carry on. But inside, you're giving the Holy Spirit something to talk to that person about. Or I might say, hey, believe it or not, someone got healed in church today of this incredible situation. We had a lady who failed her driving test because of her eyesight. She came to church. She got prayed for. She went back last week and sat the test again. And she could not only read the bottom line, but she can read the line above the bottom line. And now she's got her license again. God touched her. Hey, have a nice day yourself. That's the 30-second type testimony that we, that we can have to be able to share with people. Or a longer one might be something like, it could be a friend, they're just leaving your house and you're out seeing them off at the car and they ask you something spiritual and, and, and why, are you, why are you this Jesus freak, you know? And you can say something, I, I could say something like, I was just a shy, introverted, basically unhappy person at 15 or 16 years of my life of life, and, and one day Jesus introduced himself to me, and he poured such love into my life that the trajectory of my life changed, and I have just had a love to work with people and to tell people about Jesus ever since, and it's affected my career, and I've ended up actually as a pastor of a church, and so there you've got a, just a short testimony of something, but you won't have it unless you sit down and write it out. If we expect these things to be there just, without, just because we um, are saying it, then it won't be there. Josh, I'm going to leave the, the next one that I was going to do, so don't worry about that. But I want to tell you, you know, we need those, and we need to know what the gospel is. Because sometimes you will need the gospel, and you have not got time to go and study it and think it through as to what it actually is. I am really sad, personally, because the, I was visiting the husband of one of the older ladies in the church years ago, in this church years ago, and he was very sick. And he was coughing and spluttering, and I'd been with him, and we'd been talking, I'd been building bridges with him, but he was a very sick man. And I, I didn't take the time that I, looking back, should have taken with him. And I said goodbye, thinking, I'll come and see you in another couple of days, and I'll talk something spiritual with you. And he died that night. And I did not take the time to say to him, hey, you know, are you comfortable about what's beyond this life? What do you think you're going to be going into? What do you think the future past this life is going to be? And because he was at death's door and he knew it, 
we would have had the deepest of conversations. And I have a deep sadness in my heart because at a moment I didn't take the time and secondly I didn't have it put down in my thinking clear enough as to what the gospel actually is. You know, often I like to start nowadays by saying, you know, God didn't cause all the sin and mess and sickness and violence and wars in this world. He created a perfect, perfect people and he created a perfect, uh, perfect planet, but he gave free will to the very first people and he's never rescinded free will. And people like going their own way and not being under the leadership of God. The trouble with that is it always causes pain and problems in people's lives. The Bible calls it sin. We do things that are wrong. We're selfish. We're on a scale anywhere from selfish through to evil. And that's why the world's in such a mess. But every one of us have done these things. The amazing thing is God didn't just scrub us all out and start again. He decided that his own son, God himself, would be prepared to come and die on a cross to pay for us so that we could come back into this perfect relationship. Not perfect people, but forgiven people who are going with their heart after God. And we not only get to walk with Jesus in this life because of the cross, uh, but, and, but we get heaven in the next life as well. Are you interested in that kind of relationship? Do you know you've done anything wrong in your life? Or would you like to get rid of that and have Jesus totally forgive you of that and make, give you a brand new start again. The gospel. And we've got to be able to share the gospel sometimes at just critical moments. A number of you have come to me over time and said, my mum, my dad is, is they're reaching this stage. Alzheimer's and is coming on or sickness is coming on to such a degree. What can I say to them? But we need to do the work beforehand of figuring out what is the gospel and learning it and saying it and refining it and maybe being mentored a little bit by someone who's a bit more proficient in speaking it out so that when those moments come, we don't have to live with a regret because we didn't take the time and we didn't ask the question at a critical moment. They can happen for every single one of us. Following up the nudges of, of the Holy Spirit... Um, opens us up to evangelism that is an absolute adventure. And that's why the buzz is starting to build around church life, because we're hearing about the adventures. I was, I was having a spa in a swimming pool complex here in, in Christchurch, and I was, I was doing some laps and things, and then I got into the spa afterwards, as we probably all do, and I got talking to a 20-something-year-old young female who asked me, what do, I, what do you do for a job? And when she heard that I was a pastor of a church, she said, oh, I've been going to Grace. It's a great church, but I don't understand all this stuff. And we're sitting there with maybe six or so other people in the spa, and we got into this great conversation. And, and there was a day when I would be too introverted to talk to her too self-absorbed in my little world. But God stretched me, as he's doing to you too. And, and we took, I began to talk to her about Jesus and the change that he brings into a person's life. I talked to her about sin, and she brought up stuff about the occult and demons. And then we, as we were discussing de demonic experiences that we'd both had in different circumstances, I look around, and there's six or so other people sitting in the spa <laughs> listening intently. <laughs> it's an amazing adventure that we can get into. It's absolutely cool. The, the la lady, I led a lady to the Lord in my mum's rest home uh, about a year ago, and there were just four of us at the lunch table, and one of them was an ex-missionary, and she was talking about God and things that God had had her do and when she was in China, and, and, uh, and, and my mum was there, and my mum's quite shut down. She doesn't like to talk anything about religion because someone might hear it's a personal thing, it's a private thing. Have you heard that? Don't tell other people about Jesus. You know, and, and some of that is still within my mum's life. Uh, but, but there was an unsaved lady at the, at the table as well. And as she heard this, this missionary, ex-missionary lady talking about things that God had done through her and she'd seen, she said, oh, I'd love to have a friendship and a relationship with Jesus like that. So what would you say to her? What would you do in that situation? How would you respond to this lady Oh, I'm coming back in two weeks' time. 
We can find a little room where we're private together. Or would you just do what I did and say, are you a Christian? No, I'm not a Christian. Would you like to be a Christian? You can have a relationship with Jesus too. Have you ever done anything wrong? Oh, guilty. Would you like to be forgiven for that? Because that's what the Bible calls sin. That's why Jesus came. You can be forgiven. You can start a relationship. And here's the best part. You're 80-something now. And one day in the not-too-distant future, you're going to pass from this life. Do you want to know that you go to heaven? Yes, please. So the four of us gathered our hands together and, and we just prayed. And I said, I'm going to pray some words. You can say these words and so long as you mean it from your heart, you will be saved like Robert was talking about. And she prayed those, those words in prayer and she loves for me to turn up at the rest home. Is he, is he coming today? She got saved. I thought about it afterwards as I was driving away. How did that happen? That was so easy. And God has got things like that for every single one of us. Maybe there's a roadblock in your thinking that says, oh, I can't be involved, I don't want to know, that needs to just get dealt with today. And you want to say to Jesus, God, I want that adventure in life too. I want to get to heaven and for there to be some people there who come rushing to me if they've passed before me and they say, I'm so glad you've come because what you did made an absolutely life-transforming difference for me and I'm in heaven because of words that you said. Do you want to have that when you get to heaven? Do you want two, five, twenty, more than twenty? Oh boy, I know you do. I know you do. If that's you, I want to invite you to stand right now and I want to pray for you. If you want to say, any roadblocks, Lord, I just ask you to smash them out of the way in my life and to use me. My age doesn't matter. I can be young or I can be old, but you can use me. Des is an example given by God to us today to show us it's real. God is interested in every one of us. And he's got the mission field in New Zealand coming into our rooms and our houses and our shops and our cabs and everywhere, God. Lord, I thank you that some of the most profound moments on earth were interruptions in your schedule as you were going from one place to another. I pray, God, that you'd give us a heart, even when we, though we live in a busy world and we've got plans on what has to be accomplished in any day. God, I pray that you would interrupt us and you would help us to realize that it's you. When we see people and we hear need, that we would realize this could well be you, Lord. And I pray that every one of us will learn how to share more appropriately, how to share less and not more, but more pithy, more apt, more helpful. So I pray, take every one of us, Lord, at our, at your, at our word, and bring circumstances so that we do meet people who are green apples and are open to us, that we might be able to nudge them gently towards you and in some cases actually lead them over the line. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we sing, please take a seat for a moment and I wonder if you'd just give me the opportunity just to ask, hey, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, what is it that stops you from doing so today? I know that most of the people that are here have given their life to Jesus. You're Christians. But if you're here and you're not, it's because Jesus is on your case. You would not be here if he wasn't drawing you, drawing you. It's like a magnet pulling you in to a place where you can hear about his love for you, his great care. As I said, he didn't make the mess. We've got free will. And unfortunately, not many people in the world could ever say 
they're good with handling free will for all of their life. We've got stuff we need to be forgiven from. If you want to be forgiven today and you want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will know my, because my words are having a real impact on you. It might be the sense of battle or it might be a quiet sense of a knock on your heart. But if the Holy Spirit is working upon you, I just want you to raise your hand and I'd love to introduce you to Jesus or through Jesus to the Father. Is there anyone here today who wants to give their life to him? I'm not seeing anyone. If you, if you are putting your hand up, just make sure I see it. Hey, God bless everyone. Please, please um, stand. Thanks so much for joining us today. And our prayer is that you have sensed God's presence with you, whether that be through the worship time, whether that be through the message, or the personal story that got shared at the end, but that somehow your heart has resonated with it. And if you would like to let us know how you have been impacted, or you would just simply like to get to know us better, you can email us on office at sabc.org. Nz. Or you could go to our website www.sabc.org.nz or find us on Instagram or Facebook and like, like our page or follow us just to kind of keep in the loop of what we're up to here at SABC.